Listening to the flip side with Noah Philippiak, connecting the reality of the gospel to the grid of life. You can support the podcast and pick up some sweet flip side swag at www.patreon.com slash Noah Philippiak. What is up, Flip Aponami? Welcome to episode 104 of the Flip Side Podcast. Today I'm going to be interviewing Peter Volk. And we have, I'll read you his bio here in a little bit. We have a great conversation about community, about connection. I, I mentioned him at the beginning beginning of the interview, a line that we often use in our Beyond the Battle alumni community, and that is that the opposite of addiction is connection. And we all need connection. And honestly, in our culture today, it is really, really hard to find connection. Our culture is built to be isolated from our cell phones to the nine to five sort of commuter lifestyle. It doesn't, you know, whatever, whatever your job may be, this, just this idea that you go to work and then you drive somewhere else where you live and you lock the doors and you watch TV and you do YouTube and Netflix. And it's just this very, very isolating lifestyle. Peter talks about the abil- the need to be weird which means culturally different in order to really experience community. He has a ton of expertise on what community looks like in creative ways, especially for singles. And I think that is really, really important because we're bad at finding community, especially in the church, but we're even worse when it comes to singles. And so I think it's really important that singles and married people and pastors listen to this interview. Uh, Singles, you're going to find a ton of practical stuff. Married people, I think we need to do a better job of supporting uh, the singles in our communities and in our churches. And I've been really challenged of what I can do as a pastor um, and within my church as I think about ways of creating community uh, for singles and, uh, and, and for everyone. So if you go to my church and you're listening, uh, it's in the hopper. So <laughs> be praying uh, as I try to think about, yeah, practical ways um, to do this. This is really important. I think this, man, this, there's so much stuff in here. Uh, Peter's also a counselor. So we talk about mental health stuff and depression and how that relates to all of this. So, uh, so please, please uh, listen. Uh, one, a couple quick things before we jump into the bio. One is we are uh, working towards doing weekly podcast episodes. So basically it goes like this. If you like the flip side, if you like these episodes and you'd like to see weekly episodes, uh, please join the Patreon team. Uh, have a, we need 49, $49 more per month in Patreon giving in order to be able to do weekly episodes. So that would cover the overhead to break even on the overhead of editing and p- posting those those episodes. That's what that's for. Uh, for those that join, yes, you get some sweet Flipside swag, like my third favorite podcast is, the Flipside Mug. Uh, also, something new I mean, I'm doing with Patreon uh, subscribers only. Started this with last episode, episode 103 with Dr. Sandy Richter. We talked about Old Testament violence and how to read Judges and Deborah. And so what I did is to my subscribers, I did uh, exclusive blog post, short, uh, but my my quick candid thoughts on the interview, what I thought was good and helpful, some some challenging questions that I had, uh, some things I was maybe wrestling with, and then I asked for some interaction and gave questions to you, the pod, the Patreon subscriber, for those that would like to answer and interact, sort of like you would in a seminary classroom to have some of these deeper conversations beyond the episode. So that's what you're getting invited into if you become a subscriber as well. Would love to develop some more community with you that way. Uh, Other than that, just want to say thank you. Shout out to Angry Brew for sponsoring the podcast. I do have an Angry Brew in my third favorite podcast is a Flipside Mug today. Angry Brew is coffee with a punch, twice the caffeine of normal coffee, but it's natural and organic the way they do it. It's just a really good dark roast. Uh, Also, Shout out uh, Angry Angry Brew, I should say. Uh, the Chris's Blend is also our, our featured sponsored roast. And basically, uh, fivelakes.com, you can go there, use the promo code FLIP. You'll get 10% off your order. And they're a great Christian company. They're supporting the flip side. And you buying coffee from them um, 
helps with that support. So thank you for those that are doing that. And thank you to Five Lakes for uh, supporting the flip side. So with that, let's get into our interview with Peter. Uh, Peter Valk is a speaker, author on vocational singleness and LGBT plus topics uh, according to a biblical sexual ethic. He is the executive director of Equip, a Christian ministry that trains leaders around LGBT plus topics. He's a co-founder of the Nashville Family of Brothers, an ecumenically Christian modern monastery. He is a teacher and aspiring deacon in the Anglican Church in North America and a licensed professional counselor. He helps churches love gay people and celibate... He helps Christians love gay people and help celibate Christians find family. Follow him on socials at Peter, which is P-I-E, Peter like pi ter <laughs> Peter L. Volk, V-A-L-K, and learn more at PeterLVolk.com, and we'll have those in the show notes as well. So let's jump in to this great conversation here on the flip side with Peter Volk. All right, Peter, welcome to the flip side. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, really glad to be here, Noah. Hey, just to start off, tell us about yourself and whatever you want to share and what you're up to in ministry. Yeah, so um, I wear a couple of different hats. I am a uh, licensed professional counselor. I help run a ministry called Equip that does training and coaching and consulting with uh, with churches. Um, I um, do get to do a lot of like kind of public discipleship write articles for places like Christianity Today and Mere Orthodoxy and, um, you know, post interesting questions on uh, on social media and have like great conversation with with uh, some different people following me on those spaces. Um, I'm uh, in the process of becoming a uh, ordained in the uh, Anglican churches in North America. Um, and then I'm also a um, a f- one of two founding brothers of a uh, basically a modern monastery. Um, a uh, an ecumenically Christian, uh, intentional Christian community called the Nashville Family of Brothers, um, and uh, we essentially are kind of building a place where men who feel called to Christian men who feel called to vocational singleness, to to singleness for the sake of kingdom work with undivided attention. We're build we're building a place where in Nashville where where those men can find lifelong lived in family. Yeah. Um, so yeah, lots of different hats I get to wear. Um, but, uh, uh, but those are some of them. Um, and in many ways, all of that is made possible because of, of my call to, to vocational singleness. I feel like the Lord has called me to vocational singleness. I've committed to that. He's given me that gift. Um, and so, uh, there's all these cool different like kingdom work projects that I get to be a part of because of my availability and vocational singleness. Um, and I still need family. Uh, and so that, that Nashville family of brothers is where, is where I call home. That's that's my family. So, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, we're gonna talk about. I want to. I I want to learn more about the Nashville family of brothers. We're gonna talk about that. Um, and uh, among among other things, I I want to start with. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you about community. I, I think you have a really unique. Um, I don't want to say expertise, but you know, I, I think I think that that's an appropriate word to use. And uh, in, in the sense of finding community, you know, outside of maybe the cultural uh, stereotypical ways that we're given, you know, to, to find Mm -hmm. community. But so for me, a a bit of my background is I have a book called beyond the battle and it's a book for men on the, the subtitle is finding your identity in Christ in an over-sexualized world. And so, uh, it's helping men overcome pornography, sexual sin, uh, as well as finding contentment in their singleness and finding contentment in their marriages. And so I've been doing this for six years. We have this huge, well, I won't say huge. I mean, it's a it's a very meaningful community of friends now that I have. We call it the alumni community, and we're just we're having these deep conversations regularly about. And many of them are listening. Certainly, we have we have listeners, men and women, listening from from beyond that as well. But one line that we use a lot is the opposite of addiction is connection. And mm-hmm. I didn't come up with that line, uh, but it's just we found that to be so true that the guys that are staying connected, um, the guys that are in community. They're the ones that are thriving. They're the ones that are getting away from these, from pornography. They're getting away from, you know, these addictive uh, behaviors. And 
I just I had a couple of thoughts on that. And I just want to I want to get your um, I want to my question is going to be on just how how you've experienced or witnessed when when people don't have community and and connection and 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 I think um, when I when I look at our culture, it seems like we're given these fake forms of community and pornography, a fake form of community and hookups, uh, other coping you know numbing sort of mechanisms. But then there's also the more acceptable coping mechanisms like YouTube and Netflix and kind of just locking your door and and binge, you know, watching things, uh, you know, all, all night so, sort of thing. And I, I have found that the more myself and others, the guys particularly that we're going really deep with, if we deprive ourselves from real connection and community, the more we're drawn to the fake form uh, with porn or whatever it may be, right? Because it, it gives you kind of that fake hit of community. But then the more you go to the fake form, uh, the more you get into that rut and then the less likely you are to to reach out into like this, into real, you know, real community. So mm -hmm. I would love to start with just kind of that concept yeah. of the opposite of addiction is connection. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, how you've either experienced that personally or witnessed that uh, with the, the people, you know, it sounds like mostly men that you're walking with um, cause man, I just feel like it's a message that our culture, our Christian culture really needs to hear today. Yeah. That message, the opposite of addiction is connection. Uh, sounds, sounds hundred percent true to me. I mean, my personal experience has been, I am in sexual addiction recovery, um, and have been at that for the past, uh, like roughly decade. Um, and I've certainly seen to be seen that to be true in my own life. Um, you know, uh, any of these uh kind of things i'm tempted to reach out for as shortcuts um are really just unsatisfying substitutes for the real thing and the real thing is is connection is is healthy intimacy with with my brothers and sisters in christ and, and with jesus um and uh and kind of the best defense against those things is just kind of to go on offense and and to go meet my intimacy needs in healthy ways um and and then also in the context of those connections to be able to connect with my my painful emotions um, and, and, and give them space and to work through them and to experience healing or at least just an audience around them. Um, that makes a huge difference. Um, and then in my, my practice as a licensed professional counselor, I actually often meet with, with clients who are making sense of similar, uh, struggles. Um, and, uh, and that's what they've seen as well. You know, it's, uh, you know, breaking the habit, interrupting the habit with certain strategies and softwares can only do so much. Um, if we're not meeting the real need, for connection in a healthy yeah. way, uh, then then we're not we're gonna really gonna get to the progress we want, and and the progress we want ultimately isn't not to do the bad things; it's to live a full life. Yeah, right. Like it's 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 a, it's just a knock on effect that we're also gonna be less interested in in some of these substitutes that that, that mess up with our life, right? But like really, what motivates me is I want fullness of life. I want connection. I want. I want thriving, flourishing relationships. Uh, and then when I'm seeking those in healthy ways, um, you know, it's just easier to say no to the cheap substitutes because I kind of see them for what they are. Um, so, yeah, I think you're definitely right. You know, one reason why that's so difficult these days is because of, you know, these phones in particular. Yeah. They're just so well designed um, to, to entertain us in cheap ways but in, 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 in shallow ways, but in ways that are easy to get used to. Um, there was a, a book that came out recently that was, that was highlighted on a podcast I like, like to listen to. Um, and her book was just about like hanging out the lost art of hanging out mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and she just talked about how when people didn't have these screens to constantly entertain them, they were, they were used to sitting in a room with the people who happen to be in the home that they're in and not having a plan for how to spend the time and then just spending the time together. And there's a certain anxiety that maybe would come up from having unplanned time with nothing to immediately distract yeah. yourself with. Um, but people grew kind of muscles for that. Uh, n not only how to deal with kind of the maybe the discomfort of not having a plan, uh, a tolerance for that, but also the muscles for how to just to, to, to discover your own entertainment, to make your own entertainment, to, to enjoy hanging out. Um, and, and all these devices do is just, is just uh, you know, kind of uh, atrophy our tolerance for that discomfort, atrophy our muscles for just hanging out, uh, makes us dependent on them. Um, and then I think as we'll probably get into later, particularly when we talk about like 
community is I think the other layer on top of these phones being so addicting is that our world um, is not built for community for married people or single yeah. people You're right. in the ways that it was 200 years ago yeah. and, and beyond. Um, and so it's kind of working at us from both directions. Our world is both m built to isolate us and, and makes us vulnerable to then these, these, these smartphones um, that are perfectly designed to then meet us at that point and get us, get us hooked on whatever the thing is we're using to fast forward through life. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I, you're, you're so right about our culture today and, and the culture we're in. And I've thought about, you know, biblical the new Testament church culture in the first century where they were meeting together daily, the book of acts tell us, and you get the vibe that it's sort of a village culture mm -hmm. where you're just, you're seeing people all the time. You're seeing, you, you know, that you're, you're always in this, this community together. Um, today, it feels like to me, this is just my quick observation. I think about when I was in college, uh, I lived in a dorm. I went to a Christian college and I experienced real community. And that was a rare, that was really one of the richest, if not the richest time of my life when it came to community and brought me my sense of my sense of security, really, like mm -hmm. it was just a really vibrant place. Um, but in our culture, it seems like college dorms are like the only socially accepted place to experience that. Um, the other one would be marriage. So, okay, go get married. And then you're going to experience that with one other person, which is not the same thing as, as a life of community, but that's your other socially you know, accepted place to live in community. And then I thought of a third one, which is the assisted living home. So then, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you 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 are you can't live on your own anymore, and so you're in a nursing home, assisted living home. And and if you go to those places to volunteer or or whatnot, there's always activities going on. There's always things in the activity hall, and they're you know they're pushing you to go to the the, the elderly folks to go to those because of how necessary, right? Mm -hmm. That um that connection is. So we switch over to the church. I'm a pastor, mm -hmm. and you know. It, especially for churches that believe in the the traditional sexual ethic as we do and best case scenario in these churches i know there's a spectrum uh best case scenario the church tells a gay or same sex attracted person who's also trying to live the traditional sexual ethics there we we say uh the best case scenario it's not your attraction that's a sin it's not your orientation that's a sin it's the it's the behavior just and, and sure. so I'm, I'm i'm just wildly kind of nutshelling summarizing that as much as yeah, i can yeah. Um, so here's your options. Okay. You're going to look, uh, your options are a mixed orientation marriage, uh, which certainly does not work for everybody. Uh, and may, maybe, you know, I don't know the statistics on that. Maybe only a select few or mm -hmm. your option is single celibacy. Good luck. And we'll see you next Sunday for <laughs> Sunday morning church. Right. right um, right. and I, I my, my second question is going to be about the church and what we can do. But my first question is, how does a person, and I want to just focus on singles for now, this certainly applies to married folks as well, but yeah, singles yeah. of all stripes in the church, uh, you know, gay, straight, it, 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 singleness is singleness. Um, and, and in the sense of we have the choice to be very isolated, and that seems like what's handed mm -hmm. to us by culture mm -hmm. and even what's mm -hmm. accepted, right? This is the most socially noble thing is to have your own apartment and mm -hmm. you just, you know, you go home and you mm -hmm. isolate. How does a single person and married people be listening in here? How does a person find real community in today's day and age and culture? Yeah. 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 So I think one way to think about answer that question is to think about what's the time when it was working and what changed. Yeah, um, it's good. And, uh, you know, it was working as soon as 200 years ago, but something changed. And, um, you know, I think people can blame it on different things. Some people blame it on, you know, idolatry of romance or idolatry of marriage, or they blame it on the sexual revolution or whatever, whatever, or smartphones. Um, I really appreciate um, a book by Rodney Clapp on this topic called Family uh, at a Crossroads um, or Families at the Crossroads. I can't remember exact, the exact title, but something in that, that range. Um, but what he pinpoints as the the where kind of robust community really started breaking down um, in an unexamined way, which is why it's been so effective in some ways, right? It's not, it's not the obvious um, 
uh, culprit <laughs> um, is the Industrial Revolution leading to a really booming middle class and people could afford um, to have their own home mm. um, separated from other people um, and they could afford to move cities. Um, and they never paused to ask whether that would be good for them to just because they could afford it. Um, and he says that that's when it broke down. When we moved from a kind of a village lifestyle, a, a thick neighborhood lifestyle to people and, and multifamily, multi-generational homes and clusters of homes to people living in single family homes mm. and accessing the things they that, that were most optimized for them by driving, not by walking. And so then you could go to a church 15 minutes away and you could go to a school 15 minutes away and you could go to a grocery store 15 minutes away. And, and basically your neighbors don't exist anymore. You yeah. don't, you're not forced to interact with them. And any connection you have is 15 minutes away and doesn't occur naturally. Right. I mean, right. any of any people who are married or have kids, you know, you end up spending so many minutes and hours with your kids and your spouse doing laundry, cooking dinner, putting the dishes up, just sitting for those 15 minutes of transition time between dinner and starting to put kids to bed where it's kind of chaos, but you're in the same place. Like it's, it's these small mundane things that require sh unavoidably shared space that lead to community. And if we're separated by single family homes, you're just never, there's not enough th scarcity. There's not enough minutes in the day to plan intentional time with people in other single family homes to get your needs for community met. There just isn't. And then on top of that, people move cities, right? So people don't stay in the same place uh, for their lifetime. They move every five years for a job or whatever. And so whatever little kind of community we stitch together across our single family homes, we, we throw away and rebuild every five years. Um, so yeah, I think married or single, I don't think it's gonna get that much better until we realize that's the problem. And we probably need to think about committing to the same house in the same neighborhood in the same church for the rest of our life hmm. and, and be willing to be weird and be willing to pass on uh, job opportunities yeah, uh, and pass on lots of things in order to have the good life. Um, and I love, there's a book by um, uh, Daniel Gro Grothy or Growth called uh, The Power of Place which I think is a really compelling book. Um, and he dabbles a little bit in Wendell Berry and dabbles a little bit in uh, St. Benedict and basically makes this argument that, that, that all Christians should consider finding a place worth staying and then stay for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, that's the key to uh, kind of a, a, a fuller life. Um, so I think he's getting that right. So, so, that's, so that's broadly, I think, the big barrier. And, 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 and so, so in short, I would say, if you want more community, married or a single person, you're gonna need to be willing to be weird. You're going to need to be willing to reject this system of single family homes, move wherever you want, drive to see your friends. It's not going to work. If yeah. you try to make that work, you're going to be lonely. You know, you need to be able to be weird. Now, what is exactly the solution for single people? Um, I think it's interesting that you say that like, oh, the thing that kind of marriage, assisted living, and then college dorms uh, is a thing that seemed to work for a lot of people when they were single. Um, college dorms, uh, fraternities, they're just outgrowings of monasteries, mm -hmm. right? They're just, they're just little shadows of what was the first solution and has always been the best solution for single people, which is the monastery. Um, and I think the solution is actually not to kind of, is to basically continue the college dorm for the rest of your life. Yeah. Essentially. Um, is to continue the fr the frat house for the rest of your life. I was in a Christian fraternity, and it was that was like the source of community for me in college, um, because and this came up in my own life, right? I you know um, I I'm primarily same sex attracted, but uh, was and was out in college about being gay, but I was in a Christian fraternity that took girls to date events, and so took some girls on date events, low expectations because they knew I was gay. We ended up having a good time. I ended up dating three of them, falling in love with two of them, 
almost getting engaged to to one of them and we broke up for reasons I'm related to my um sexuality um but like I knew Christian marriage could work for me I'd also thought a lot about what the Bible has to say about singleness uh and so I knew both of these were kind of options for me and the Holy Spirit just kind of made it clear to me that I was supposed to ask God if if he had a preference for which gift to give me singleness for marriage. Um, and so very long story short, felt some clarity years later that God was calling me to vocational singleness, to the kind of singleness spoke about in Matthew 19 and 1 Corinthians 7. Um, but I knew I did not have some kind of like magical gift of celibacy that I didn't need community anymore. So I went to my local pastor and I said, um, how am I going to find the kind of um, community I need, family I need in our church to do vocational singleness well? And he responded very honestly, he said, you're not going to. Hmm. You're not going to find the kind of community you need at this church or any church in Nashville anytime soon. Maybe it's different in Grand Rapids. I don't know. I won't speak for you. Um, but, but that's what he said about Nashville. And then he said, but monasticism, and I go to an Anglican church. It's, it's not Catholic, but, you know, we, we're more traditional in some ways. Um, but uh, he said, he said, Peter, monasticism has been the most common way that celibate people have found family. And monasticism has been the greatest source of social justice in the church. And monasticism has been the greatest source of theology in the church. And monasticism has been the greatest source of evangelism in the church. So I think if you're going to stay in Nashville and there's not a monastery here yet for you, I think you should gather with some other men and you should start, you should build a, a modern monastery. And, and find build the family you need. Be weird. And then stick around at our church for your lifetime and teach our church how to do family in the body of Christ better. And maybe by the time you die, the next generation of celibate people at our church could find enough family in the body of Christ at our church that they wouldn't need a monastery. But, you know, if we look at the past 2,000 years of Christian history, the monastery has been necessary and will probably be necessary after you die. So that's the <laughs> very long-term vision my pastor gave us. Yeah. Um, and that's what ultimately led to the Nashville family of brothers I'm a part of. But I, I think, you know, so, you know, we can't go back to 200 years ago, but the way our world is built is not for a community. We're going to have to be willing to be weird to get the kind of community we need, whether you're married or you're single, and particular for single people, I think the kind of weird you're going to need is a monastery mm -hmm. in some form, in some fashion. Um, you know, we can call it an intentional Christian community, um, whatever you want to call it, but, but I think that's what it's going to take. Um, and I think, uh, living in a studio apartment and trying to connect with friends across the city and then moving friend groups and moving cities every five years, uh, that's, that's just going to lead to loneliness. Yeah. You know, the cost of, of, of loneliness, the cost of freedom is loneliness. Mm, mm, yeah. Well, I have a couple of questions. Hopefully I don't cluster them all together. That's when sure, I'm, sure. Bad, I know I said I'm a, a bad <laughs> podcast host when I do that. Okay. So I want to, I want to scale this. I want to scale that monastery idea down. Cause I think your average listener is like, yo, I ain't starting a monastery. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. Like, totally, okay. Totally. Um, so take some ingredients of that. All right. And, and I, and I want to then apply it. And this might be a separate question or the same question. I'm not sure, but I'm picturing, the single person that's listening and they're going, I don't feel that call to singleness. I, I really want to get married. Like they have, whether they're, they're straight or they're gay. Um, but I, you know, they're just like, I can't, um, particularly I'm thinking of some straight singles that, that I'm friends with, you know, that we're helping with this issue of connection and isolation. And they still think marriage is the, you know, marriage is the, is the be all end all marriage is the thing. Like they must have it, you know, to, to secure their, their validation and identity and all those things. And, you know, there's, that's kind of where they're at. They're like the idea of singleness terrifies them and they're, I'm not choosing singleness. It's not, it doesn't feel like a gift to me, you know, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And, and, and single men and women, both who are, I, I feel like there's a, there's a, this is culturally, stereotypically, you have a certain age where it's like, okay, you're in your 20s, you can live in a house with some friends, and the culture is like good with that. You have housemates, you rent rooms, and as you get into maybe your 30s uh, or 40s, or I'm not sure, it, that just seems less common. It's, it seems mm -hmm. like that's less common with the people that I know. The singles that I know in their 40s 
are living alone. They're living yeah. in apartments by themselves. Um, and, and so take some of the ingredients of what, what you're doing, um, the, 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 the components of the monastery life, the intentional Christian community life, and let's take mm-hmm. this single man or woman who's in their apartment by themselves, struggling with all these things, right? They're disconnected, they're isolated. And I'm saying like, yo, you need to get connected, you know, and I don't think they know how. And I think there's a level of defeatedness and probably depression that goes along with it of this rut they're in of like, I, I don't even have the, I want that full life you're talking about, but I don't have the get up and go to go, to go make it happen and to, you know, build it. So this is probably multiple questions, but let's just focus on, um, (laughs) How do you how do you scale some of that, or how can you take some of those ingredients to someone that's living alone in an apartment? They're not going to join a monastery or start one. But I like what you said about being weird. They have to sure. learn how to live weird. Weird meaning culture might look at what your your living situation is and go, "Oh, that's weird." Yeah. But you, in yeah. order to experience this type of community, you know, just, just some ideas of, of what helps someone brainstorm what that could look like for their life. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the biggest barrier might be, uh, but I think the most important ingredient in many ways is that, um, you know, we, so we're as humans, we're embodied, right? The, the body, our physical earth matters. We're destined for a physical new heavens and new earth and resurrected bodies, embodiment, presence, place matters so 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 much and it just cannot be replaced by by uh like i message prayer chains and <laughs> facetime hangouts it just yeah. can't and so um my first suggestion would be like find two to three other people to move into a uh, kind of a multi bedroom apartment thing together yeah but if you don't have shared space you're just not going to get much out of it. You'll be putting a lot of effort into other solutions, trying to fix the problem of just not having shared time and space, not having that proximity, not having that 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 shared time, doing the dishes, doing laundry, whatever. Um, but you can you can just do it a year at a time. You know, find two or three people and say, "Hey, could we live together for the next year?" Okay. Yeah. And during the next year, here's what we're gonna do: we're gonna have a an, a, a kind of family or house or apartment dinner once or twice a week. Okay. Not every, not every night, but you know, Mondays and Thursdays, we're always going to do dinner together. Okay. Um, and then maybe, um, every weekday morning before we go to work, we're going to do, um, a, a quick round of prayer requests and say the Lord's prayer together. You know, however early enough to where we can all be there at prayer in the morning. And during that year, we'll, we, let's go, let's go do some community service in our neighborhood together once a month. Um, during that year, let's go on one vacation together, the four of us. So we were really like plan to have time off and plan our budgets to have money to like do a fun vacation together. Um, and then, um, yeah, and maybe we can do some con- confession and accountability kind of things. We don't even all have to go to the same church. If we do, that could be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, let's serve together. Let's do meals together. Let's pray together. Let's do some vacations together. Who knows? Maybe maybe you know we, we can all do Thanksgiving together or Christmas together. And let's just do that for one year. And at the end of that year... If you want to keep, you want to do it. If we want to re up it for another year, we can. If one of you needs to move out, you can, and a different person can move in. But let's just let's do that. There are expectations, there are rhythms. Um, it is lived in, um, but it's only for one year at a time, and it's and it's not super cumbersome. Um, I think that's a great like way to start. That is it's still a stretch for many people, yeah. but not that weird, not too weird. What about uh, first of all? I love how you how that how it, it scaled up. It started with, you know, the two to three and living in a in a multi bedroom, and then it builds from there. I, I think that's yeah. very uh, attainable, right? When you start, when you start with one step at a time. I am wondering mm-hmm. about the person who says, "I don't have two to three people that I could go and ask that." I, I don't. I don't know sure. where I where I would go. You know, to find those two or three people and and a different layer would be what if they say no right and I, then i feel this totally 
I feel this totally. rejection. So maybe you could address those two things practically. Um, yeah. well, and, and some of this too, it's like, I'm going to get to it. My church question is going to be next. So we'll save that one. But some of it is like the way our churches are structured. I, I think if church is just like this place, you go to watch a show and leave, like you're right. just right. It's so, um, but where does somebody, cause that's pretty, I think that's real for, for mm -hmm. people to go. I don't have two or three people that I could ask. Do you have brainstorming for them on, on where they could go to find two or three, obviously develop, right. To develop yeah. relationships like that, that, that could lead, you know, to that sort of ask. And, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it there for now. Yeah. Yeah. The, unfortunately I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, particularly if kind of people are feel like there's not an easy access to that meeting those kind of people at their church or they don't know who those people are already. Um, or they may know who those people are at their church or know those people already, but but either you know those those people they might invite may be preferring to live alone by this point, or they may prefer to live alone. They may be like, that's a nice idea, but I kind of don't want to get into that again, you know? And and I know a lot of people who are single in their 30s and 40s and beyond who settle into preferring to live alone, um, not because like they're not lonely living alone, they are, but because the the pain of the revolving door of roommates yeah. was more painful than just being alone. But they don't actually like where they are. They don't actually like living alone. They actually, they, 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 there's part, there's ways that they've numbed themselves to the fact that they hate it, but they hate it. They just think it's the least bad option available. Yeah. Um, and I think if we could, in people's 20s, build these kind of one year recurring intentional Christian community things, and then some, and then that could lead to, to groups of people who say, okay, what if we do this for three years? What if we do this for, 10 years, right? It could build into something that eventually is people making long-term or maybe even lifetime commitments to a community that could provide stability. There could be a place where a single person in their forties says, I don't have it in me for a revolving door of roommates. Yeah. But if I know this is the people I'll live with for the next 30 years, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can do that. And what you're um, describing is a lot more intentional than just having roommates, right? Because everybody has a, has a bad roommate story. This person yeah. was renting a room and they were doing all this stuff, right? As debauchery or they were loud or whatever, you know, uh, where you're, you're talking about a community that's intentional in the sense of we're here for this purpose. Like we're, we're, we're agreeing to this covenant, you know, we're, yeah. um, and that's a, that's a big difference too, right. For, yeah. for people listening, it's not just about having roommates though. I would argue just being around other humans is still Better than nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just being by yourself and nothing looking at you, but these blank walls. Um, but this is different than just having roommates. It's cultivating yeah. something. Yeah. And I don't want to in any way shame anyone who's listening, who is one of those people in their thirties or forties or beyond and prefers to live alone and, and feels like I'm kind of putting something on them. Absolutely not. I, I get how painful the revolving door of room of roommates has been. Um, so, so I just want to say that, but, yeah. but yeah, to, to the struggle of kind of finding people to do this, um, you know, I, I do think in an ideal world, our churches are the places where we would, we would find those people. Um, but I think there's a couple of reasons why maybe we're not finding those people at our church. Um, one of them is that uh, I think a lot of our churches are not teaching about a robust theology of vocational singleness. Um, and our churches are kind of refusing to accept the responsibility that kind of the church first accepted in Acts 6 to, to, to make sure those who are celibate and single find family and have a home. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, we, we know statistics like single people are more likely to struggle with uh, depression and anxiety they're more likely to doubt whether God exists and they're less likely to rebound from doubt. So some of it is just that there are single people who maybe were meant to be single for a lifetime who were starting out in our churches post-college and then because of the lack of the support they were getting from their churches, they deconverted. Mm. They're just not following Jesus anymore Yeah, because of the lack of support they're getting. Yeah. Um, there's some other people who, um, you know, maybe were supposed to, to walk out singleness long term, but instead um, demanded the gift of marriage from God and are now married, but maybe never were supposed to be married mm. and were supposed to still be single in a healthy way. Um, 
There's also ways that maybe there's just some single Christians who feel like, um, I mean, there's a lot, I, you know, uh, I, I work with churches for a living. I do church consulting for a living. I know that one of the most stable ways, one of the best ways to stabilize your giving at a church is to is for it to be anchored to kids, basically, and families who have kids. They're the most likely to stick around and to donate consistently. And so just naturally, a lot of churches programming them becomes revolving around attracting and keeping um, families with younger kids, middle school and younger. Um, so there's a lot of single people who just stop going to church, even yeah. though they're still following Jesus, because it's not optimized for them. It's optimized in a different direction. And so I think all of these things contribute to, to a, yeah, a single person in their 40s saying, I'd love to start some intentional Christian community like that. Uh, I don't know where those people are, yeah. and they're not in my church. And there's got to be ways for someone, let's say, that's going to stay alone, uh, living alone for whatever reason, whether that's what they prefer or they listen to this and they're just like, OK, whatever, I can't do that. I'm just I still have to think that there's got to be ways they can be. I'm just brainstorming out of this conversation's challenged me because I'm a pastor, you know, and I want to I want to get to the church question here next because I'm putting myself in the same boat like we as churches have done a poor job with this and i want to brainstorm some ways mm. we, we can do better uh, but i i think for those who are listening that are single there's there's got to be ways to even if you're going to still live alone to be connecting with people regularly outside of your nine to five job or, you know, you go to work and like there's, mm -hmm. there's gotta be way. I, I just feel like it's such a default today because of technology and what's given to us is to go home, lock the doors, watch TV, sit on the couch. And then you're just, you're just isolating yourself. Right. And, and there's yeah. all these, these isolating behaviors. So, um, I just want to kick that around, you know, for listeners that if that's you, I mean, you've got to find out what's happening in your community. You have to be around people, join as much you know, join th like clubs or hobby groups or, you know, like stuff at your, your church, depending on the size of your church and what they offer throughout the week. I just feel like um, at, at, a, at a basic level, the, we we have to up our, I don't know, we have, we have to up our level of, uh, of, of, of connection and then perhaps tasting the fruit of that and then going, okay, maybe I'll listen to that Peter guy now and mm -hmm. actually like change, you know, change something that's, that's a bit more, a bit more next level. Um, no. But so I don't know, I have some thoughts on, on, or I have a question about the church really that I want to, that I want to get to. Do you have any thoughts on that first before I move on as far as just ways people can connect that, that you've seen that's worked well um, that, that perhaps isn't, um, you know, living within the same place, but right. um, still yeah. being rooted in a community and, and having connection um, many, many days during the week and just, and what that can look like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, maybe one suggestion and like one sorts of kind of empathy or, or a, a sympathy. Um, uh, one thing is I, I just, you know, I know even, even talking to my married friends, right. Uh, or sorry, let me back up. Um, and we all would prefer connection that's just organic and spontaneous, right? That's the most magical stuff. That's the sexiest stuff. That's what we all want. We want to we want to just connect when we feel like it and 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 let that be the driver. And every married person I've talked to, they get to a certain point in their marriage and they're like, if we don't schedule date nights in a recurring way that they just show up on our schedule and we do it, if we don't sometimes schedule sex in a way that we just know this is the night we're going to have sex, it just doesn't happen. And that's not because our marriage is failing. It's just because in life, you can't rely on things just only doing things when they're spontaneous yeah. or when they just come up organically. Like you just, it's just not how it works, you know? Um, and I don't think friendships are any different. Um, so I, I just, I really encourage people to like, you know, pick two or three people in your life that you're going to get breakfast or coffee or dinner or lunch with every week and put it on your calendar and do it every week, no matter whether you want to go or not. And then find a, a cluster of friends here, a cluster of friends there to do a trivia night or a kickball league or something, and then just put it on the schedule and do it. But I think it's just really important to have recurring like commitments mm -hmm. for connection. Um, so I have I have lots of one-on-ones on my calendar 
for 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 every week. I'm in some, some ways maxed out in terms of my like breakfasts in particular, just because I know that like you know if 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 I wait and for it to kind of be convenient and for me to kind of me be in the mood to reach out to someone for breakfast, then we'll see each other once every two months. Yeah. Or if we just make ourselves go to breakfast on Tuesdays at six a.m. every week, I'll see my I'll see my 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 godson's dad and uh and one of my good buddies from college i'll see him every week so that's what we do yeah i love that well let's switch over the church side and i i think um even as you say that there's there's things churches offer or parachurch ministries too um that in, in the in the areas of i mean i'm most familiar with men's ministry stuff because i'm a man and i have be on the battle book and things but i yeah. i've got to think there's some women's ministry stuff out there as well though i think i've seen some strong men's ministry stuff locally, uh, online as well. Uh, but where you, your, your scheduled in thing can be, does your church have a singles ministry that meets on Thursday nights? And mm -hmm. is there a men's Bible study or a women's Bible study, small group, you know, that you can go, to? and those are limited, but at least they're scheduled, right? Like, I, mm -hmm. I love what you said about it being scheduled and intentional. I know a friend of mine runs a men's ministry and part of what they do is just meet at the same restaurant every Tuesday night and they have dinner mm -hmm. and they have deep conversations and it's the same group of 15 guys, you know, give or take that show up. And um, totally. sometimes it's built for you and you just have to show up, um, you know, and find find those those spaces. So that's just a suggestion, you know, for listeners. My question is with myself as a pastor, you know, there is a reality to we don't live in the Acts 2 culture anymore. We don't live in this village lifestyle like we've yeah. talked about. We're in this commuter lifestyle and I do. I, I I touched on this earlier, but I struggle with whether it's the example I gave before, which is, you know, someone who's gay, same sex attracted, and and we say, okay, a life of single celibacy, that's it for you. Good mm -hmm. luck to you. You know, we'll see you next Sunday. And mm -hmm. we here's what we have to offer. Like in 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 a standard church, we have our Sunday morning service, so at least you have that on Sunday morning. And then we have your small group and you have that once a week and that's it. And that's supposed to replace like a lifetime, you know, of, of community. Um, right. Another mm -hmm. example, I, I, my church, we, we planted our church two years ago. We're intentionally in the inner city, multi-ethnic, and we're a great mix of like inner city folks and people commuting in from other places. But I find, have find this often where uh, someone accepts Christ they get baptized, but their their setting of where they find a where their lifetime of community has been has been on the porch with the friends they grew up with and their cousins oh. and their uncles, and they drink uh, to a a very unhealthy you know massive degree of, of sure. you know, alcoholism. Uh, smoking marijuana and like that's what they do that's just like how they yeah. relax it's their community and i feel like when it looks when i look at discipleship and i go i'm telling you that you have to give all that up you, the, the people that you're living the village life like they're living the village mm -hmm. life in, in and yeah. this is an, an impoverished neighborhood type yeah. setting so you have literally multiple generations in a house not mm -hmm. by choice uh, but by necessity and then you're hanging out on the porch kind of numbing out on life. Sure. And I'm saying, don't do that anymore. Don't do the, those behaviors, the, the heavy drinking and the marijuana. Instead, I'm going to give you a Sunday morning service and a once a week small group. And maybe once every quarter, I can take you out to lunch, right? <laughs> like right. This is what yeah, I feel yeah. like I have to, to replace the, what they're, where they're finding meaningful connection. Um, okay. And those behaviors aren't going to stop, most likely, as long as they're with, because you're going to become like the people you know you hang out with. So I just want to pick your brain on this because, for me, I go well. Then I have to be their community because I'm I'm the pastor, right? Yeah, yeah. Whether it's the gay guy, you know, who's single, celibate, and lonely, or it's the guy on the porch who's like, this is his life, and he, he that's his connection. And but I'm married and my wife is an introvert and like she has a full time job and I cannot yeah. just open the door to my house because I don't live in the Acts 2 culture. Like I, I live in this culture mm -hmm. and that often ministry is called a mistress for a reason, right? Like it can mm -hmm. ruin marriages and, and all this. So um, yeah. I don't expect you to have the silver bullet answer to all these <laughs> things. But the question I want to nail down on is what can churches do within this culture 
to provide better community for all because and i love up to this point we've talked it's really like the initiative of the individual listening there is a lot of initiative that the person has to take but i feel like as a pastor we've got to do a better job like we've got to do a better job of providing this type some type of of consistent community especially for those that are isolated but in a way that doesn't kill pastors if we can avoid that. So right. oh, I would just, sure. maybe what have you seen churches doing that that works well? Or, you know, what, what advice would you give to a church that's going, man, we want to get better at this. We want to have more of these spaces and community connection spaces where, where people can come together to connect. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, in some ways, you know, my, the kind of ministry that I feel like God has called me to uh, his has been kind of focusing on the surgeries or the real solutions instead of the band-aids or life rafts. Um, there are lots of people out there who could give you some uh, life raft or band-aid ideas. Um, my fear is, and what I, at least I've noticed in my lifetime in the church is that we just own, we just buy uh, truckloads of band-aids yeah. and never do the surgery. So I'm just going to talk about the surgery. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, I, I mean, I think, and I think in some ways the best place to start is, is with, is with single people in particular, um, because they can, if you found, have found, have single people, um, committing to intentional Christian community, committing to a place, they can become a nucleus of a broader experience of intentional Christian, Christian community, um, in a church and could lead to a movement of a bunch of people in a church saying, Hey, we're all going to actually live in this neighborhood. And we're going to commit to this neighborhood. Maybe it's only 30% of the people in your church, but those people are going to find real community. Um, and I think in some ways it begins with a key lever for that is making a distinction between the singleness we're all born into, the temporary abstinent singleness we're all born into, um, that can continue into one's 30s and 40s and 50s, kind of an uncalled, uncommitted, perpetual, kind of born into singleness distinguish that from the kind of singleness that Jesus talks about in Matthew 19 and Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 7. Um, the kind of singleness that's actually gifted, that's actually blessed, is a permanent commitment to singleness for the sake of kingdom work. Permanent giving up of romance, dating, marriage, sex, biological children for the sake of using the availability from that that we would have used to do the kingdom work of raising kids to instead do other kingdom work, but still in the context of community. And so I, I think in particular, if our churches were actually teaching what the scriptures have to say about vocational singleness versus temporary singleness, we're helping every Christian discern between vocational singleness and Christian marriage. Um, we're distinguishing between who are these singles who feel called to Christian marriage, but are right now kind of in this kind of per, kind of never ending temporary singleness. And we need to help them move into Christian marriage more quickly. Okay. And then who are the Christians who are called to vocational singleness? And they're actually, they're not looking for short-term solutions. They're looking for the final solution. They're looking for a place to find a lifetime family. Because then you're going to identify the actual, the cluster of, of singles who are interested in building real intentional Christian community. So, but you have to distinguish between those two groups of singles first. Yeah. And in many ways, give them the categories and inspire them and help them discern between those options um, and give them hope for that. Um and then I think our churches can be can be incubating those intentional Christian communities, particularly for vocational singles, for particularly for singles committed to to singleness for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I've noticed in, in small ways that when those kind of houses of, you know, four single people all committed to vocational singleness, all going to the same church, start living in a certain neighborhood and start inviting some of the married people in their church with who have kids and some of the other yeah. single people and saying, Hey, what if you move in next door? What if we all move into the same neighborhood? What if we move in within walking distance of each other and we start to have do some open door life with each other? Yeah. Um, it's going to be small. It's going to be organic. But I think that's what's going to make a difference um, for like 50 years from now. Mm. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to incriminate myself. Raise your hand if you've never taught at your church about the difference between the vocational calling of singleness and the calling of marriage and helping people discern which is better for for them or which one God's calling into. And for those only listening, 
my hand is raised here. <laughs> Man, that's it's that's amazing. Like to hear you, I I, I receive that from you uh, prophetically. Like like mm -hmm. I don't think very 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 few churches are teaching that to singles to 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 you know anyone. Like they're we're not we're not teaching that. It's like just this sure. default. Like you're gonna get married, and if you don't, well, you know. I mean, that, that's how that's how everybody takes it, right? Like, yeah. it's it's man. So I think that as a starting point is um, that's really challenging to me. Like, I yeah, I am. Yeah. I really want to. That that to me feels like an, a, a a game changer for for a starting point for for this whole conversation. Yeah, it's practical. Yeah, and uh, and I think also it actually will lead to healthier marriages. For those who are called to marriage, and um, and I want to be clear, I don't think that this means that like fifty percent of Christians are called to singleness and fifty percent are called to marriage. It's it's probably still something like nine to ten, eighty twenty. I don't know, you know, like this, I think still marriage is going to be the most common kind of vocation for Christians. Um, but I think if we enter into this discernment process with an open handedness, then those who are eventually called to Christian marriage won't see it as something that they were owed or something that is just default, but instead a, a calling to lay down their life for the sake of the gospel in a particular way. Yeah. To, to, to go on that mission with their spouse. But they're ultimately called to just as much sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom as any single person, as any celibate person for a lifetime. It's just a different path. Um, and so they won't take for granted that gift of marriage. And then for those who are ultimately called to singleness, if they actually are going about this in an open-handed way and are taught the beauty, beauty of both of these options and, and hopefully eventually see these modeled both in their churches, then they don't feel like they're being cheated of anything by being called into to yeah. vocational singleness. Um, and at least in my life, doing life with some of the married people um, that I'm closest to who have kids, the more we've done life around each other and seen what's beautiful and what's difficult about vocational singleness and Christian marriage, the more that actually neither of us feels like we've got it better or the grass is greener on the other side. Mm -hmm. We both see that like God called us to different things. These are both good. There are things about the other that I'm jealous of. And there's things about what I've got that I know they don't have that I'm really grateful for. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where we could get to as a church. Yeah. Uh, I have a practical question uh okay. this is for um honestly a friend who's listening uh, and so um what's your advice for a gay same-sex attracted christian celibate single person they're living alone mm -hmm. and they can't really find a church because they're committed this person is committed to the traditional biblical sexual ethic um but the churches that they're finding that say they're committed to that as well are um, they do not feel comfortable being real in that space. Mm. They, there's also very condemning messages about if you're gay or same sex attracted in those spaces, they feel mm. like their two options are a church like that, where they have to hide uh, their orientation and they can't, they just can't find real community there, even though they're living again, surrendering all this to Jesus, obeying, you know, what, what, what we believe is true in scripture. Um, and then the other side is they open and affirming churches and they're like, I don't want to go there because they're, sure. they're encouraging me to sin. Like they're telling me to live, yeah. you know, in sin. So the result is they're, they're, they're extra lonely. They don't, they can't even find that, that Christian community. And on top of that, and, and maybe this is just for like, if you could speak some hope and encouragement to them where they feel like this extra shame because one, they feel like they're the only one, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that is this way. And they can't even like talk about this at church. So it's there's this extra level of of shame around something that isn't a sin. This is this is they're not they're not living in you know any sort of active sinful lifestyle. So I'm wondering if you could just I mean it is a specific person I want to give some encouragement mm -hmm. to, but but you know just um, man we're talking about church being so important and and yeah. where they're living they they're like I I can't I can't find a church. Yeah, that's tough. That's real tough. And I know those 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 spaces exist. 
you know, where, where they're, they're that, that those really are the only two options in terms of churches. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure the person is considered like if it was possible to move to a city where, where there may be other options. But I know there's some people who because of work or because, you know, they're caring for a, a parent who who is ill um, or, or whatever the reasons are, you know, moving is just not not an option. Um, and so a couple of things I'd suggest in that space, um, is there are some kind of, again, it's not embodied, so it's not what I would like first suggest, but there are some spaces online to connect with, with other Christians that are kind of on the same journey as, as this person is. Um, there is a kind of a, a fairly large kind of, um, private Facebook group of, of gay Christians committed to a traditional sexual ethic where a lot of people can connect um, and find support from a distance and maybe even discover there's there's people in their area that have a similar story and, and convictions that they can kind of do life alongside. Um, there is a, a really neat conference called the, the Revoice Conference that does kind of a yearly uh, gathering of, of, of gay Christians committed to a traditional sexual ethic. And they also have uh, some ways to kind of stay connected in between those conferences, uh, including kind of some like local chapters in different major cities. And so there may be a local chapter in, in that person's city or somewhere within driving distance, even if it's somewhere that like once a month, they drive an hour to hang out with people who are along a similar journey, that could be a real big encouragement and that would be in person. Um, and then there's some other ministries kind of specific to different denominations um, that, that kind of kind of provide fellowship around some of those some of those things. Um, and, and, and it may also be true that despite the fact that there is all these kind of unfair circumstances stacked against this person, right? And, and far be it from me to ask this person to take on any more hardship, right? Or do anything any more difficult. And I know that in what I've seen in my life sometimes is I'm bringing to the Lord some of my very reasonable frustrations about circumstances and what and what ought to exist for me already, but does not exist yet. Mm -hmm. And kind of say to God, like, God, you know how much I'm already on empty and 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 mm -hmm. and feel and, and feel like I don't have what I need to be healthy because of yeah. maybe decisions other people have made. Uh, and I need you, God, to show up. Or, or other Christians to show up and make this work for me. Um, and, and Lord has very tenderly said, um, I hear you. I hear you. Um, and, and, and I want to ask you to do some more hard things. And maybe you do the work of creating some of the things you need. Yeah. And so maybe the Lord is calling this, 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 this person, this friend of yours, to, to choose a church that maybe teaches the traditional sexual ethic and seems to send some signals of a possibility of compassion and then go to that church and share their story, knowing they're going to get some negative reactions and teach that church how to care for them. Mm. Knowing that in the process of teaching that church, teaching those pastors how to care for your friend, your friend's going to get hurt a little bit. Yeah. Maybe the Lord's calling them to do that. I don't know. Again, I'm not putting, yeah. <laughs> this no. is not a word from the Holy Spirit. I don't yeah, know what God's yeah. putting on this person, but I know that sometimes when I've not had what I needed and I've gone to the Lord and I've said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on empty. I've done the best I can. It's your turn, God, to make it work. God has come back and he said, I, I hear you. And I want to invite you to, to push a little bit more. Yeah. So I don't know. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're winding down here. I, I wonder if you could just give any word of encouragement. We've already, I think, have, but just as kind of someone who's resigned themselves to, I think even as your, you know, your work as a counselor fits into this as well. I think it's just easy for us to resign ourselves to, again, my work is with helping men overcome pornography, sexual sin. And there's guys that just resign themselves to porn because it, it soothes them and it, it, it meets uh, the, the need of comfort, even though it's, it's empty and, and, and false. And I think there's singles that resign themselves to a life of isolation. I sure. think there's married people that resign themselves to a life of isolation, but I mean, I see you living it. You, you have, you, you're living into this space. You're living into this community. Just, I get the sense you're, I mean, you're saying this is worth it. Like this is worth making the effort. Uh, there's those that have, that have, stopped making the effort maybe they've tried and failed and and so now there's sort of a learned helplessness is there anything just kind of as we we wrap up i'll give you um 
another we'll, we'll do a kind of a final question here but just for right. um as we get close to wrapping up just a um just a word of encouragement to someone that feels like they're kind of tired of trying and they've just mm. resigned themselves to to the rut that they're in totally totally yeah, uh, and it I, I, at least for me, the times when I feel like I particularly got in a rut and tired of trying, um, maybe it was because I, I got almost to a place of a, a little bit of kind of depression or despair around it. Um, and for me, what was particularly what was often characteristic of that is um, I, I had some some grief or sadness around what I didn't have yet that I wasn't that I kind of didn't want to connect with. Um, and, and, and some of that, like frustrated gr grief, you know, un, 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 um, my resistance to mourning in some ways, what, what wasn't, what was, what was kind of draining me of motivation and like graying me out. Um, and, uh, or things sometimes I worried like, oh, it's too late, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I ducked out of that group three years ago. I can't go back or I've already gotten out of the habit of, 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 of really putting myself out there in that way. I, I can't start again. Um, or maybe we feel some kind of shame towards ourselves or God that we've kind of, we've, we've, we've tried, we've, we've stopped trying and we've gotten in a rut. And, um, you know, I, I want to say that like the Lord knows all of the, the, the difficult circumstances that have piled on top of each other to make it feel like it's kind of impossible for you to try again. Um, he knows how hard it's been. Um, I don't think the Lord for a, for a second, I don't think the Lord for, for a second is, uh, you know, looking down upon you with shame or disappointment. Um, I think he's just like, he wants to care for you. He wants to hold you and he's eager for you to get back up again and try with a clean slate. Like, don't worry about the mistakes you made in the past. Don't worry about how, uh, how many times you tried and it's not seemed to work out or how long you've given it up and you it's never too late to like to, to start again and to try again. Um, and I've seen that to be true in, in my own life. Uh, you know, it, it was it was worth uh, trying again. It was worth yeah. getting back up and putting just a little bit more effort into into some of the things I hoped for. When you say mourning, you know, the beginning of what you said about your story, mourning is that is that sort of like a holding on to this life that I feel like I should have had, like kind of this alternate reality, and I I'm holding mm -hmm. on to that, and and so the the mourn is the mourning process, the grieving that that isn't going to happen and moving on like there's a healthy of moving on here i'm not i'm not an expert in this i just want to ask you to kind of unpack that a little bit for someone because i think there's there's um i think what you said is is really helpful um for because a lot of our depression i feel like comes from being feeling stuck like i'm stuck mm -hmm. in this place i want to be over i want i want that and god isn't giving me that but i'm here um can you just kind of unpack if anything I said is helpful, you could use it. If not, just ignore it. Yeah, but just yeah. kind of unpack what you mean by by mourning and how that was helpful for you to kind yeah. of move forward. Yeah. So, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, a lot of kind of therapists or kind of psychologists or whatnot would say that, like, the typically depression, uh, at least clinically. It comes from kind of a, a loss of, of meaning or purpose or love or, or people in our life or, 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 um, or identity. Um, and then we have not grieved that loss. We've avoided grieving that loss. Um, and then that ungrieved loss kind of turns into despair and hopelessness and grayness and numbing. And the solution to depression then is in some ways actually to be sad. <laughs> the solution to depression is actually identify the thing that you lost that was really sad, that felt too sad to connect with. So you went to things to numb yourself so you didn't feel sadness. And instead, go to that thing and be sad. Like really cry it out or whatever the version is for you, however you need to mourn or grieve. But like really honor this thing was lost. This thing died. This thing broke. And that sucked. And that deserves a funeral, you know, yeah. metaphorically. Um, and, and, and so I think in my own life, there was a way that like I would just 
I, I just felt like to be a good Christian, I always had to put a smile on and believe everything was great about my story and, and everything was working out just how God wanted it to work out. And that gave me no permission to be sad about my circumstances and to mourn what was sucky mm-hmm. about my world around me and about me, you know, and that led to depression. That led to me using sexual addiction as a way to numb my sadness instead of connecting with my sadness um, and accelerated a process of, of depression. But when I actually just was honest with myself, that like this is sucky and really sad. And I think I just need to cry about it. I think I just need to be sad about it and give myself permission to be sad. Um, that's kind of when the depression went away. That's when like, cause depression kind of honest, often manifests itself as like a lack of motivation. It, it, it tanks our motivation our desire to try again, some ways and some, sometimes connecting with our sadness, crying it out, giving ourselves permission to mourn and to grieve is the way to rediscover motivation and the desire to try again. Mm-hmm. Thank so, you. Not for everyone, but for some yeah. people. Yeah, well, and, and that's the type of thing I think anyone in that spot, go to your counselor, take what you just said and say, what does yeah. this look like for me? You know, what? Yeah, yeah. I want to explore this further. What does it look like for me? I feel like there's some things I need to mourn. There's some things I need to grieve. I don't know how to do that. You know, help me do that. But I, I what what I see in you is you, that was a part of a process of of un, unstucking you. You know, you were mm-hmm. unstuck. Yeah where you could start to move forward again and you grieved what wasn't there anymore, like the funeral and, but, and, and we're going to, now we can go through a healing process of that. And, and, but there's life to be had there beyond yeah. that. Right. And, and cause you're not, yeah. So you, you that's great. That's really good. I, and I just, I encourage listeners to not just listen to this podcast and then move on to the next one. But if that's right. you and your situation, like, yeah, meet with a therapist, talk deeper, you know, uh, talk deeper about some of these things and say, what does this look like for me? Cause I'm, I'm resonating with some of these themes. So let me get you out of here on this, Peter, just, um, just final words that you want to say to listeners. If there's, if there's maybe some resources you want to direct them to some ways they can connect with you, uh, you know, online or just some resources that you offer. I love this. I think we've, we've hit on some, we've hit on some really great points and I'd love to help connect people, particularly, you know, People that are feeling isolated, they 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 need some resources, some connections. You've mentioned some great ones already, uh, mm-hmm. but just anything else that you want to say, kind of as a final word to to point people in the right direction as we wrap things up. Yeah, yeah, I know every person's story and journey is is unique, and so you know this may just prompt some specific questions. You know, some, this may prompt a sense in a lot of people of like, okay, but 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 my my, I'm in this particular place. What about that particular question? Um, please reach out to me, you know, email, uh, social media. Um, you can find me on, on Instagram, Twitter, threads, TikTok, Facebook. Um, and my handle is at P I E T E R L V A L K. Uh, first name, middle initial, last name at Peter L Volk, um, on each of those platforms. Um, or you can go to my website, which is Peter L Volk.com. Uh, and you can email me, message me through that, but yeah, please, um, ask me your questions. Like, let me know where you're at, where you're stuck. If there's any way I can be helpful, um, to help you kind of take, take the next step there. Um, as well as lots of free resources, um, uh, you know, lots of stuff I'm kind of sharing on Instagram and uh, on other platforms regularly. Uh, and then on the website, blogs, video articles, um, uh, kind of links to, to other podcast episodes about similar topics, different topics. Um, uh, so would love to just connect people with like, with, with whatever lo- they're looking for. Awesome. Peter, thank you so much. This has really challenged me and I hope it's challenged listeners to, to, to act, to, to, to mm-hmm. initiate community in their life. And it's challenged me as a pastor. So, man, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank you, Noah, for the opportunity. All right, welcome back. I hope that conversation was helpful and interesting to you and it challenged you. If you wanna continue the conversation, become a Patreon subscriber. I'll be posting an exclusive blog 
just on this episode, just my thoughts on it, asking you some interactive questions. I'd love to hear back and forth. You're welcome to just read and not respond or to respond and would love to build some more community with you that way. Patreon.com slash Noah Flipiak is the way to do that. Also, if you're a guy and you're looking for some of this community, uh, it is online, but we have a dynamic Beyond the Battle alumni community that I would love to invite you into. Uh, we have multiple Zoom uh, calls a week. We also do two in-person retreats a year, which are awesome and just life-changing. Uh, the entire alumni community is free outside of those retreats. So head over to beyondthebattle.net if you are looking for that type of community. Thanks for listening. I hope this podcast is an encouragement to you. I hope it challenges you. I hope it helps you to think more critically and to take practical steps in your life uh, to experience the love of Jesus that he has for you. He, do, he loves you, and he, he is inviting you into that love. And just uh, to kind of just piggyback off the last question I gave Peter, if you're in that state of feeling defeated, feeling like, I've tried this, I can't get back up again, you know, just re- reach out for help. Don't try to do it by yourself. Uh, reach out to a counselor or a therapist. Um, many, if you don't have insurance, find one that, that has a pay scale. There's free counseling services out there as well, but have somebody help you get over the hump, get over the stuckness. Uh, but to keep going, Uh, there's just to keep going. God's timeline is, God is so much slower than than we are. He, he, he moves so slowly and just to know that that's normal. He has not given up on you. Um, but, but take those steps, be intentional be tenacious. If you can't be tenacious, get someone next to you that will be tenacious on your behalf and will push you and prod you. Uh, Let's spur one another on towards love and good deeds, as the book of Hebrews says. So I hope this podcast episode helps you do that. I hope the flip side helps you as a whole. Thank you so much uh, to those that support the show via Patreon. Thank you so much for everyone who's listening. I really appreciate you. And I will see you next time on the flip side. The Flip Side with Noah Philippia is a Beyond Ministries production. Copyright Noah Philippia. www.noahphilippiac.com. Theme music by Kyle Lake at K Lake Music. Used with permission. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever podcasts are found. It's time to bring me closer. There's no purgatory because you're in or you're out. When you see them in the clouds, do you know it's going down? Raise them, raise them, raise them. They've been sleeping for some ages. Now all God's babies so confused by this hatred. Poor pit preachers shouldn't aim to be A-list. Money probably long, but short is with your days. And you ever-